so greetings. Uh, good morning. Um, you're now listening to Chief Rock's YouTube channel and the SoundCloud here. And we're sitting again here uh, in, in a part two of our interview with uh, Winston Shrout. Now, now, the first part went really well. We're just doing a follow-up with Winston on a lot of the different aspects of commerce and, and admiralty law and contract law. Uh, Winston, how are you this morning? <clears throat> I'm doing just fine. How about you? I am I'm good. It's uh, We're here on the West Coast. It's Pacific time, and I'm uh, not as tired as I expected to be at 9 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm an early riser, so... Yeah, I'm a I'm a night owl, so sometimes I'm up to like two, three in the morning. So oh, no good at all. You need to go to bed when the sun goes down. Of course, so, you, I guess you young folks are a little bit better suited to that than some of us old timers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, going out. I'm a music artist, so oh, yeah. Well, you didn't know that. What yeah, kind of music? A, what kind of music do you do? I uh, take my traditional. Um, Haudenosaunee uh, social music and I've been putting it over top of like electronic hip hop sort of beats <laughs> okay yeah it's a really good uh, hybrid of music and uh, it's been well very well received lately amongst uh, a lot of the um, uh, music goers that, that, that I've been doing shows for and, and I've been performing for uh, fashion shows and oh, great you yeah, know, I, I, I do uh, I do my native traditional music, too. It's called bluegrass. That's what the hillbillies do back in the mountains. You see, you, you play you, you play something? <laughs> I play a little bit of everything. Oh, yeah? You know, if you go to our, uh, you know, some of the uh, seminar DVDs uh, and different things that we've produced. I hear that. Yeah, I heard, I heard all that music. Yeah, well, yeah that, that's, that you... uh, that, you know, that's, uh, yeah, a, a lot of that is stuff that uh, we've co-produced me and the audio guy he he likes to play mandolin pretty good and i back him up on the guitar sometimes uh he, even one of the uh, seminars we featured uh dulcimer music which of course is a uh, traditional appellation you know type music and so forth so yeah hey i'm into the music end of it too hey that's good that, that tells me that both sides of your hemisphere of your brain are you're, <laughs> you're using them right absolutely <laughs> Plus, I'm a. I used to be a, a welder. I used to be a construction guy working. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. So, and you come from that kind of background too. Yeah, yeah. I've welded up a lot of steel. So we we have a lot of the same background now. It's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, the the one thing I did have uh, we so we wanted to get into is maybe uh, touch on a, a little bit of UCC again. Uh, maybe in regards to some sort of enforcement. I know we, we spoke about getting a certified copy to bring into the court mm -hmm. and and perfecting uh, perfecting your lien on, um, I guess, property because it has to be registered in order to perfect it. Mm -hmm. um, just maybe because, I mean, what, what's happening is a lot of the people from at least what I'm gathering is they're not they're not sure what to do. They don't know what to do. They, we, they've heard about this thing called a press to pay. Where you don't even need to go in front of a judge. You can get a, a writ or an order written up. And, uh, uh, the foreign... Yeah, that, that, that actually goes back more to the common law concepts. Uh, if you want me to, I can give you just a bit of a history that might be helpful to people to understand You know what has been in the past and the situation that we're operating with at present. Oh, please, yeah. That'd be great. <clears throat> Well, basically, it has to do with the nature of money, and that is, uh, you know, the nature of the money that we use in commerce has changed considerably since uh, around 1933. Uh, certainly by 1935 and 36, all the countries on the planet had gone into bankruptcy. And then uh, the reason for that was so, you know, that they could... Uh, basically, do uh, inter international commerce, uh, debt currencies were certainly introduced. And so the, the money situation changed the nature of the commerce and it also changed, it also uh, necessitated, you know, a change in the law form that we go by. So over a period of time, I mean, prior to that time, <clears throat> There had been inroads made, you know, or certainly since, uh, uh, well, it's, uh, for instance, in the late 1800s, they passed what was known as the Negotiable Instruments Law, 
And so they started operating on, on those levels already. And then after the 1930 uh, period of time, when there was a change in the money, then eventually they came to the uh, <clears throat> uh, adaption and adoption of the Uniform Commercial Code in order to uh, resolve any disputes that might arise in commerce. So <clears throat> I think probably a, uh, you know, a knowledge of the, fa of the change in the money is instrumental in understanding what we have today. Now, w with the change in the money and the countries operating from a bankrupt position, uh, that basically did away with the common law on the basis that uh, it's impossible to uh, execute a contract. Uh, people have to understand that a contract does not exist where it's made. That contract exists when it's executed or paid. And so if you can't pay a contract, then the contract itself is not a contract. It has to uh, evolve into a different form. So that, that would make sense in regards to that. There, all the All the fiat currency being used isn't real money. I mean, it's a form of exchange, but you're not really paying anything because you're using a debt to pay a debt, essentially. So well, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the words you have to take out of your vocabulary is the word pay. You can't pay. You there's can't no pay. pay. Yeah, there's no, no. pay. Yeah. Uh, the only thing you can do is adjust the account. And so that's been the whole emphasis on our education uh, process over the years has been to teach people how to properly adjust their accounts. Now, we do have a problem in as much as, uh, you know, since, since we've gone to public policy uh, and, uh, you know, the common law has gone away, so to speak, that we, that we do have a few uh, misunderstandings about uh, what we call money of exchange and money of account. And that is we do use from time to time money that has equity attached to it. For instance, when you go in labor and you exchange your labor for, for a currency such as Federal Reserve notes or, or whatever kind of money it is you're using in Canada, there is equity that attaches, you know, to the actual uh, money that you exchange for. So it's how you use that equity money. <clears throat> uh, and I'll have to say that, that, you know, once properly understood, then the people will stop being robbed of their equity by, uh, you know, the processes that are being used. Uh, and, and that is, is that in, in all of your public, uh, uh, doings, uh, for instance, uh, taxes, mortgages, or anything that appears in the public, which is not strictly a, a, a private uh, dealing, then, then money of exchange is not required. Uh, the only thing that's required is money of account or the adjustment of the account if it's necessary to use negotiable instruments such as notes or drafts and so forth, that's okay. But but there, there's no equity that can attach to a public debt. And people are being fooled into believing that they have to give up their labor in exchange for a debt that only requires an adjustment or settlement. See, so, so people see, are getting ripped off. See, I have a uh, document it's a notice of tender for set off and it's more we're, what we're doing is we we've been having I had a, quite a few clients who took the uh, statement of account they would write accept it on it sign it date it and then turn the bottom part into a money order mm -hmm. and then tender it back to them saying here's here's your document back and we're accepting the credit cuz all the all the documents all have positive numbers there's no negative numbers showing that you owe something it's always a positive showing a credit and uh, so they accept that credit, tender it back for set off, and uh, they, they, these people steal the uh, vouchers all the time, and they never ever um, honor any of the uh, agreements. 
Well, then they need to be sued in court for recoupment. Let, let me explain that a little bit further. <clears throat> you know, th this is the basis, you know, for the problem is, is that a system was put in place. For instance, here's, uh, here in the United States, it first was authorized under House Joint Resolution 192. Uh, and then I think uh, Queen's Council, or what do they call that uh, situation in Canada? What's that? Do you remember the name of that uh, act? Uh, Queen's Council and whatever it is. Anyway, it had the same effect. And, that it, that, and, and that's the basis for what we're doing. Now, uh, really to completely comprehend, and I don't think we want to go too deeply into this because it might confuse people a bit. Uh, but certainly the understanding between uh, between the difference uh, between a, an open account and a closed account is technically essential. Uh, when we, for instance, when we do an acceptance on an open account, well, in essence, what we're doing is we're closing that account, which means the interest you know stops running on that account. And once the interest uh, stops running, then, then we go into a settlement, and the settlement again uh, has to do with um, you know money of account or adjustment and so forth. And so people are getting tricked into keeping the account open by tendering money that has equity attached, and that that's completely backwards. I mean that it, it's actually illegal here in the United States. That is illegal. But the you know the banks, the mortgage companies, the government agencies get around get away with it when the people are uninformed and don't come back and demand that they comply with public policy and, and so forth. The uh, thing you're looking for was the order in council. Yeah, order in council. Uh huh. Yeah, that would that's what that's what you're uh, I guess yeah, you're referring I to. I can't remember all those names. Yeah, order in council sixteen. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It's so it's illegal. To, and you know what? And down in uh, down in the United States, and and I know, and I and I think we spoke about this before that Canada is registered with the SEC, which I guess would some people say that doesn't matter that that Canada is its own, it's a Commonwealth country, and and uh, United States is not. Well, uh, the, the word Commonwealth, if you go back and study it. It traces right back into history, right through uh, England and back into the uh, Vatican. You understand, back in the 14 and 1500s, the uh, Vatican created three Sestakevi trusts, and uh, from that, you know, that's where a commonwealth stems. Commonwealth, uh, I think, also has close ties to the feudal system. Now, for instance, uh, the the state that I was born in was called the Commonwealth of Kentucky and it, that's what it was it was a Commonwealth also and in the beginning but then as things changed certainly as the form of money changes as the uh, public policies and so forth come out then the effect of a Commonwealth uh, probably is negated because uh, because of the uh, of the money and how we use it yeah yeah so in practical terms, I mean, whatever you want to call, you know, a government or a political institution and so forth, you can call it what you want, but then you have to investigate to see what's really going on. And then once you, you know, once you see what is really happening, you know, then it don't make any difference what you call it. <laughs> yeah. And um, as, as you speak about investigating, uh, there was a, a gentleman who was hired by the uh, Canadian Army to uh, research and find out who Canada's uh, future threats could be. Mm -hmm. In his uh, research, he comes to find out that the Canadian courts and the local police state, local police are the actual enemy Absolutely. of the people of the Canadians. And, Absolutely. And uh, there's corruption, there's coercion, there's colluding, there's all kinds of... Uh, conspiracies going on within within the, the, the lawyers <laughs> and the police officers and so he he found he started reading more about the admiralty world that's actually going on and what he did is he actually 
stop paying his mortgage to see what would happen. And he, uh, you know, he kind of did a bunch of stuff. And basically, because he knew that that the that the original note that he that he signed with the, to get his mortgage after his research, he he started finding out that they sold that on the on the securities market. So they've never been able to produce the original, and those who have paid it off have never requested the original back after they paid it off. And uh, basically, he went went into court and presented all his evidence, and he found out that a lot of the courts in Canada are taking those court dockets and they're, they're taking it to the Minister of Finance here in Canada and then they're selling it on the international market, all the court cases. Yeah, I think that'll probably come to an end though. Uh, here in the United States, you understand, uh, people have to understand that, that when, a, when a complaint uh, is filed, it, it's always an assumption of debt. And when an attorney uh, file such a thing into the clerk of the court and you have to realize that the court is only a bank anyway when that in, uh, when that complaint or that criminal indictment is filed with the clerk of the court it is in fact a negotiable instrument and the attorneys are simply using the court as a third party debt collector on that instrument so the question always comes in regards to a complaint or an indictment is who is going to be the payor on that indictment? In other words, who's going to, who's going to pay that assumed debt? And so, uh, you know, some of the technology we use, you know, is to break down the assumption of the debt, or if we want to go ahead and let the debt turn into a presumption, then we then we go into various vehicles that could be used to adjust that account. Because what the courts are trying to do here in the United States and all over the planet is, is that what they're doing is they're taking in uh, an indictment or a complaint, which is a chosen action, <clears throat> and, and they're making a judge, they're making a summary judgment on that uh, instrument, and then demanding uh, payment in specie. So the courts are guilty of conversion. Of a, of a non-security and so these uh, complaints and so forth that come across uh, you know are being converted it's illegal it, it, they're being illegally converted and the judges are demanding that the defendant pay in specie or what we would call uh, money of exchange that has equity attached to it now the reason they do that of course is so they can steal the equity and labor of the people. So we're trying to bring it into that. And and what what's going on to do that? What, what do you, when you say bring an end to it, what what's what steps or what what's a uh, what background stuff is going on? Well, it has to do with uh, dealing with the uh, courts and so forth. Right now in the United States, and I would have to suppose in the uh, courts in Canada and other places, <clears throat> uh, there's what's called a sequester. And that is they're having to readjust how they're doing things <clears throat> on the basis that, you know, that what they have been doing is unlawful and fraudulent and it has to be brought to an end. And so at this point, I think they're measuring what can be done to, to change that system and, 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 and turn it back into what it was originally designed for. And again, here in the United States, that ha a lot of that has to do with the demise of the uh, Federal Reserve banking system. The U.S. Treasury is working to reestablish, uh, you know, the functions and so forth. But you have to understand that, you know, the, the biggest problem that we've faced across the planet is is the problems caused by central banking. And so, so when those things are resolved, when we get when we get the banking resolved. And there's a lot being done to resolve that problem, but 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 when the banking is resolved and the banks are required to uh, follow their charter, then then you'll see the same uh, changes and so forth happening with the uh, courts. I'll give you a for instance. Here in the United States, <clears throat> uh, the 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 uh, uh, complaints. And indictments and so forth that came in, as I mentioned, 
are negotiable instruments. And so uh, those negotiable instruments, if they're not paid by the defendant or by a representative for the defendant, they go into a dishonor. And so those those uh, negotiable instruments slash complaints are dishonored by the defendant or by the trustee slash surety for the defendant. And in consequence of that, they take those instruments to the federal window for funding. And they do that, in our case, to the county comptrollers. So let's say a, a uh, complaint comes into a civil matter uh, the defendant comes in and starts to argue about it. Now, see, this all goes back to bankruptcy again. Maybe we can explain that so people understand it. But in any event, a uh, instrument comes in uh, in a civil or a criminal matter into the court as a third-party debt collector, and then the uh, defendant argues about it. That creates the dishonor. And so, so then at that point, then that delinquent creditor who argued about it is now subject to liquidation uh, through involuntary bankruptcy. And in essence, that's exactly what happens when the, uh, when the negotiable instrument slash complaint is taken to the comptroller of the currency. They simply present that at the federal window for payment. Now we do the same thing to them. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not a one way street. I mean, <laughs> See, we, we, when we do an ex when we do an acceptance for value, and they dishonor that acceptance, we go through the same process. Although we're not using the county comptroller. Yeah, that that's the thing I was going to ask. What what? Well, before we get into that, before I ask what 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 we are using, uh, maybe it could go back into explaining what what you say it goes back into bankruptcy, and you you wanted to maybe go into that a little bit. Okay. Yeah. As I mentioned, since uh, since since the adoption of a debt currency such as Federal Reserve notes. Uh, you understand that the Federal Reserve notes are the reserve currencies and all other currencies are measured against the Federal Reserve note. And so uh, in consequence of that, all the currencies across the planet are debt currencies because naturally if they're measured against a debt currency such as the Federal Reserve note, <laughs> then they have to be debt currencies also. Now, right. th th this was a result of the bankruptcy of the United States, first off, the United States has always been in bankruptcy, but up to 1933, they were operating with uh, substance back currency in that respect. But in any event, as things change, as circumstances change. Now, l l let me state right here, I'm not against that happening. I'm not at all. It was the only way that we could have accomplished what we have today. But in any event, uh, getting back to the subject matter here, and, and that is, is that uh, the United States began to operate what's known as a Chapter 11 reorganizational bankruptcy. Now, a Chapter 11 reorganization is an interesting animal in as much as, as mentioned, it's a reorganizational bankruptcy, which means, you know, it's not a liquidation, it's simply a reorganization so that the company or the corporation can continue to do business as usual uh, without the interference of the creditors uh, as in a liquidation, as in a Chapter 7 liquidation style. So, as a result of that uh, Chapter 11, you have to understand that whoever files the chapter 11 is known as the debtor in possession. Now the debtor in possession operates in the reorganization as if they were the trustee. And as long as the debtor in possession operates the reorganization correctly, they will remain as the functional trustee in that chapter 11. Now, for instance, in the United States, the United States Corporation filed for Chapter 11 became debtor in possession. So, when, when, when the debtor in possession sends out a request, now, let me, let me just stop right there. You have to understand that all corporations are joined at the hip. For instance, we have the United States Corporation 
we have uh, you know the, the you know the state of Kentucky. We have uh, IBM Corporation. We have uh, uh, Department of Justice, which is a corporate. Anyway, all these corporations are the same corporation because uh, you know the mother corporation just simply authorizes these baby corporations. But every every corporation is simply a subset of the United States corporation. Period. So, but isn't there a um a difference in the type of corporation like one's a like a legislative nope. corporation nope. and nope. so all, all corporate nope. no matter government or business it's all the same kind of corporation are and, they all written in capital letters yeah that's the end of it okay and and who are they registered to the united states and canada who uh, who's the, who's the mother to them uh probably uh the crown of england i say probably cause i can't say for sure but for instance, the United States uh, Incorporated is actually a maritime corporation uh, registered in uh, Puerto Rico. So they've gained control by whatever means. And, but in any event, what we're trying to get to here is a demonstration of the debtor in possession and how they act in the Chapter 11. So uh, the debtor in possession then, when the corporation needs money, who do they go to? Do they go to the priority stockholders or do they go to the common stockholders? So if you know anything about a corporation, you know that the corporation raises capital by taxing the common stockholders. Now, the common stockholders in, in a debtor-creditor creditor relationship are, in fact, creditors. And so the, the, the debtor in possession when they need to raise money for the corporation, they go to the common stockholders slash creditors and request the money. Now, if the creditor slash common stockholder refuses to give the money in whatever form, then that, that creditor becomes a delinquent creditor and they can be taken into involuntary bankruptcy and liquidated for the amount of that dishonor. You see, so so when the United States, you know, goes to the common stockholder and say, "We need, you know, we need a, uh, you know, a billion dollars over here for this, or a trillion dollars over here for that," they simply just just go ahead and do it, and then put it on the back of the people as the uh, what they call the national debt of course it's not a national debt it's a federal debt but anyway they use the device of the chapter 11 bankruptcy to accomplish that does that make any sense or does that raise more questions yeah i mean it it, it starts to raise a lot more questions and i guess the first thing that came to mind without really without really fully hearing your explanation was in possession of what exactly Say again? Uh, I mean, the, the first question that came to mind when I heard you bring it up, when you said uh, debtor in possession, uh, it started making me make me think, well, possession of what? Uh, well, it's it. that's the title of the particular position. Uh, people misunderstand bankruptcy, uh, you know, from that. Uh, hey, could you hold for just a second? Sure. Okay, sorry, I'm back. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, I got you. Uh, yeah, the, the term debtor in possession uh, may be misleading. Uh, people have to realize, you know, when you get involved in the public and everything, you know, everything is just backwards of what it sounds like. Now, for instance, a bankruptcy it's, itself, uh, the purpose of a bankruptcy is for the debtor to discover the assets of the creditors. That's why the creditors have to file the proof of claim, or what's called the B-10 form. And so bankruptcy, you know, is backwards of what people think. 
And so when you start to talk about a bankruptcy, you know, the question arises, who's actually in control of the bankruptcy, the debtors or the creditors? And the answer is the debtors are. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, you have you have to rethink. You have to rethink things because it, it it's not always as it seems. So in, in regards to the Chapter 11 reorganization that the United States is operating as a Chapter 11, the question arises is who who is the controlling party? And the answer is that the debtor in possession is. And so when they go to the common stockholders slash creditors with a request for money and, and the uh, creditors don't supply that to them, then they go into the liquidation phase. Now, to see, that this is the basis of why accepted for value is so important. Because in essence, when, when, a, uh, when an instrument or when a, what under the UCC is called an incomplete instrument, is sent out to one of the uh, uh, creditors or one of the common stockholders. Uh, in essence, what they're saying is, is that we need this amount in this account, uh, you know, for the adjustment. And so, if you oppose that, then they'll go ahead and go into the liquidation process. And so, we don't oppose it; we accept it which closes the account, which stops the running of interest. And then we give them the use of our exemption as a pass through for, for, for settlement on the transaction tax. You understand uh, that in the system that we operate with, uh, the, uh, it is a benefit privilege to be a part of that system. It's not a right. See, it's a benefit privilege. And for every benefit privilege that you participate with, there's a tax that's required. In the case of financial transactions, that's, that's called a transaction tax. And so, uh, you know, when there's any kind of a, uh, a incomplete instrument that's sent to you and uh, so forth, uh, you know, the completion of that transaction, there's a tax, you know, that's attached to it. And, and the accounting company or the agency that handles that is the Internal Revenue Service or the, uh, what do you call it in Canada, it's the same bunch. But anyway, they're the ones that hold the accounting on all those transactions. That'd be CRA. Yeah, CRA. And so when, when we start to do acceptance for value, uh, and a while ago, you mentioned someone that had used uh, an acceptance technique. Yeah. Uh, uh, certainly, I would hope that they had supplied their exemption for the pass-through Treasury Direct, so that the transaction tax, you know, could be settled using the exemption. And so, so, so that's how that's how we settled and closed things. Yeah, okay. see, I, I, my thought on that that was when we did it, reading a lot of their bills of exchange that merely just writing accepted and signing was all that was needed because they had the uh, pass through account already as to how they're even able to access the credit to even offer it. That if that makes any sense, like you know, a lot of these companies already have your social insurance number. So, or your SIN number. So, why provide it again if that you know they've already? Because, because you know, because maybe you need to authorize them the use of that exemption for the pass through. They, they may have. They may. Ha First off, it's not your number. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not our number for sure. That that was the point I think of the discussion we had, had prior when we had a, another interview. And that is uh, the use of the uh, UCC one financing statement to take control of that number. Yeah, yeah, we actually didn't get into that of taking control of that number. Oh, I thought we had. No, we just we just discussed the uh, filling out of uh, securing securing property and and the basics of the UCC one. We never actually went in to to the actual UCC of securing the birth, the birth certificate bond or the sin or the driver's license. All right. Well, just uh, real quick. Uh, you can use a UCC1 financing statement to take control of that number because no one else has filed on it <clears throat> yet. And so uh, routinely when we do a UCC1 financing statement, we include that, what, what people call in the states a social security number, what you're calling the social insurance number there in Canada. 
So we take and put that on the UCC one financing statement. So we have, so we have a claim on that number. But even if you didn't do that, uh, you still have a proprietary right to the use of it because you're the party that signed as the surety on the account that produced that number. So from strictly proprietary position, you would still have control of it. We just do the UCC one to further that. But in any event, we don't want to get back onto the UCC uh, financing statements at this point. Perhaps we could a little bit later on. Okay. But in a nutshell, that's why we would do that. In in any event, the the uh, uh, the permission to use that number as a pass through is essential to extinguish the transfer tax. Okay, so so merely taking a criminal charge or an original accusatory charging instrument. And writing accepted on it, and running your your the social insurance number, would would stop that that instrument tax. Uh, yeah. Now let me get a little bit further into that, and I'll have I'll have to describe it in the form of a trust. Uh, basically, and, and this is something. This is a foundational concept that everyone should understand. Uh, and that is any time the outcome is uncertain, there is risk involved, and consequently a trust is formulated. So everything that we're doing uh, when, when we're using fiat currency, like again, we're back to the money issue, you see. Any, anytime we're using a fiat currency, which is a debt instrument, the outcome is uncertain because nobody knows if that debt's going to be paid, paid or not. And so because the outcome is uncertain in regards to the money that we're using, then every situation that we get involved in, in the public, is in fact a trust situation, you see. And that, 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 again, is the genesis and basis, basis you know, for all the, uh, uh, you know, things we've become involved in. For instance, if you, if you take a court case, when the attorney files that negotiable instrument at the time of the filing, is the outcome of that instrument a certain? The answer is no, it's not. Uh, the outcome is, is uncertain as to what's going to happen with that instrument. Therefore, when that uh, complaint is filed with the clerk of the court, a trust is set up. So, so the real question, you know, that the clerk of the bank or the clerk of the court, as it were, it is, uh, is to basically contact the surety trustee uh, to find out are you going to pay this or not. You know, that's the basis for it. And so so when people say, no, I'm not going to pay it, then they go into controversy, and then under the provisions of the reorganizational bankruptcy, then they get liquidated for yeah. that amount. And so when we're talking about arguing, we're talking about going in and saying, no, I didn't do that, I'm, I'm not guilty. Oh, we never say that. Well, well, I mean, that's basically what they're trying to get you to go in and say, not yeah. guilty, I'm not going to pay. And people don't even – I try to tell people that. They don't really – comprehend and go pay what i said well it's a charge think about it of a charge card you know like you know they're telling they're putting a, a, a duty or responsibility on you that they're imposing that yeah but let me finish up with the thought process i was working toward okay which is that uh any any trust that not is not indentured is considered to be assessed to cave i trust and so when we do an acceptance, uh, basically it's, it, it's in the form of a SESTK VI. And so, so we indenture that trust. So in our, in our acceptance language, we put that trust indenture in there, which is, in our case here in the United States, we simply put the uh, uh, indenture on there, which is, uh, deposit to the U.S. Treasury and charge the same 
you know, to the straw man and, and the straw man account. And so we're indenturing that trust. Now, this goes back to the concept, you know, basic trust law, you know, trust law 101. <laughs> and that is the intent of the settler is the law of the trust when it is expressed. And so when we do an acceptance, we're going past the uh, assessed decay by concept and we're going into an expressed trust as the settler. Because again, let's say, let's look at my account. You know, I have a social security trust account with a number attached and so forth. But as it turns out, I am the only contributor to that account. And therefore I am the settlor. And so when the settlor expresses his intent in regards to that trust, that becomes the law of that trust. So, so when a complaint goes into a court and the clerk sends a summons and a complaint and a copy of the complaint to me, which is an incomplete instrument, then when I do an acceptance uh, on it, sign the thing, date it, give my exemption number for the pass-through, and then indenture it which is deposit to the, U the U.S. Treasury and, and then charge back against the uh, straw man account, then I have completed that trust. And now that is the law of that trust. So just maybe go back a little bit when you're saying uh, they send you a summons and they send you basically a promise to appear, right, is what you're saying? Well, a summons uh, goes back into admiralty procedures. Yeah, they're requesting your appearance at the court. And so, uh, along with the summons, they generally send a copy of the complaint of the negotiable instrument. And that copy is only an incomplete instrument until it has an original signature on it. That's why right. we, when we do acceptance, we put that original signature on there. And by the way, you know, that, that reverses the whole court situation because now... Uh, once you have accepted uh, that incomplete instrument, now you become the holder in due course. Now, holder in due course doctrine uh, should be studied. It's important to understand holder in due course is contained in Article 3 of the Uniform Commercial Code. And I think you can read about that uh, UCC 3 in the 300 series. Okay, so Article 3... Hold in due course. Yeah, uh, that's, an, that's an important concept to understand because here, here's the why it's so important is that only the holder in due course has any rights and, immun er, rights, uh, rights and immunities on the instrument. They're the only party that legally can execute that instrument. Now, when that original signature complaint comes from the attorney to the clerk of the court the clerk takes it to the uh, judge the judge locks it up in his vault but he has not reached the status of holder in due course on that instrument because he has not accepted it nor guaranteed payment therefore he has no rights and defenses on that instrument he cannot execute it they do it anyway but that's theft so Maybe to to be maybe be a get bit clear, so the 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 summons or the promise promise to appear you get and the accommodating documents telling you what charge that your person's being charged with, you want to accept that for value, accept it for value, uh, put put on your pass through account and then and you, and you want to send them the original but make a photocopy for yourself or maybe get a certified copy from notary and then send it back to them. Uh, for set off, no, set off. No. So you only send original by. <clears throat> so when they send when they send you a copy under the UCC, that's called an incomplete instrument. Yeah, but but your original signature on that document turns it into a firm offer, which can now be dealt with. Now, once you put your signature on that thing. Now, you become the holder in due course, and then at that point, you have all the rights and defenses on that instrument. Right, but any, you're, 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 any, you're... 
anyone else that tries to execute on that instrument is a thief, and then you deal with that. Yeah, but I'm saying you, you once you do that, you send the original back to the court. Yeah. Okay. Original, then, original signature. You can't put uh, anything into the court without an original signature on it. Now, do you do you just mail it to them by regular mail, or are you saying do you, do you attach it to enter take, it into the court case? Yeah, you can you can go ahead and file what what you would do in most practical cases is that you would file a, a regular court document. The title of the document would be simply notice of acceptance. And then you might have a few lines in there, and then you might say see exhibit A. And exhibit A would be the would be their copy that you've put an original signature on, and you've put it back into the court. So you either mail it in or take it in, whatever, and get you know using the normal court procedures. And so that when 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 you file, now listen, when you file that into the court, which is an original signature document, at that point you would request a certified copy of what you just filed. Ah, so that's why it's important to bring it in in person. Then. Usually. And then at that point, with your certified copy, you can go on to the private side and make it a part of the record using the evidence rules. Now, once it gets into evidence, now that's the recordation. That's, that's, the, uh, uh, that's the finding of fact uh, you know, that, can, that can be leveraged you know, to get that thing settled. See, a lot, a lot of people are missing that whole step. They, you know, once they sign it, they don't know what to do with that. And I think that's the main... Um, well, it's, it's too bad that the courts are so dishonest. We shouldn't have to go through that process of sticking the thing into the evidence file and making a record of it. But because the courts are, because the clerks of the courts and the judges and so forth are dishonest, then we have to go through this whole process of putting it into evidence. It should be a normal transaction. They should take that original signature acceptance and adjust the account, reducing it to zero. Using yes. your exemption for the past. <clears throat> the, the and in Canada, uh, the one, the one, a few of the gentlemen would go up and say, "Well, I, I want to inspect the original charging instrument or the or original complaint to see who signed it," and they'll say, "Well, we don't have an original; it's in the computer." You know, so, and so I'm like, "Okay, well, that doesn't make any sense because." Uh, the last gentleman who, the one I told you about, who went in front of the judge without a robe, they uh, during his trial, they said, "Well, we 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 they have an original uh, charging instrument, but they weren't gonna, they didn't bring it out for him to inspect. They just showed him a copy." Well, the pro probably the situation is is that they have already sold. See that that's why I say in, in the background, the uh, courts are are thieving. They're stealing. They, they, you know, they're, they're selling an instrument, which is a debt instrument. They're selling it on the market or whatever, or, or passing it back, to, you know, through the uh, federal window and so forth for payment when they have no right to do so. The judge, even with the original in his hand, is only a holder. Again, go back to Article Three on holder in due course doctrine and find out the difference between a holder of an instrument and a holder in due course. Only the holder in due course has the right to execute on that instrument. And the judges are not holder in due course, yet they're going and executing those instruments with nothing more or less than, than, than pure thievery. They're thieves. Yeah, and, and these aren't even judges. They are administrator. They are uh -huh. a, a justice-like. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, they're all doing it. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're not a real judge. I think the, the lady who actually came to that gentleman's trial to uh to hand down her her judgment was it was an actual judge she actually didn't have a robe on and retired on that day so you know well but, what you know what however they appear first off most of those folks are so mixed up they don't even know what their job is in the first place so they might come in with a robe in a robe off or whatever and until you get to someone who is very well educated you know who knows what they're going to do we've got some people in sitting on the bench uh, who, who are so poorly educated, you know, that uh, it, it, it goes beyond reason, I'll put it that way. Yeah, I mean, when I went into the one court case that was dealing with my person, and I went in there and I, I uh, spoke my language, and then I asked her a few questions, and 
mainly about the treaties, and she had no idea about any of the treaties that her her queen and king had with my people. That's it. And I'm just like, really? She was ignorant. I was like, should I buy deposited or gave you some document or some reading material that you can go review before we go before we talk like like it was so um blatantly ignorant she she had no idea well sometimes it is a good thing to create what we would call a memorandum of law or a memorandum of points and authorities like i say uh, the, these people who who have that job uh are, are very poorly educated on purpose I mean, they, they put they put dupes and dummies in robes and set them on a bench and tell them, here's what we want you to do. And the first thing that they tell them is, whatever you do, don't study the law. Yeah, you always got to bring law, points of law in front of them or else they, they can't. But, they you have, know, what, what, no what, idea. What, what, what's the other funny thing is they are, they're bringing up case law from behind the bench against someone who's trying to uh, self-represent. Well, we, we 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 deal with that too. What? How do? How would you deal with that? Deny it. Well, because she there's this case in Canada called Meads versus Meads, and they, all these judges keep bringing it up against anybody. Then they're also labeling anybody who goes in to defend himself a free man on the land, which right. therefore, which you get slam dunked in the court, and they don't. They they. Uh, my one friend, he was doing a contract with this guy uh, in a civil case. He. Uh, <clears throat> The guy reneged on his contract and actually, you know, cost him more money. And so the judge, the, the lawyer stood up and said, well, this guy's a free man on land. And that was it. The other guy won without even going into the case. Well, look here. Look here now. <clears throat> if you go to the uh, United States uh, Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, uh, or in Canada, you have some very similar <clears throat> anyway, uh, in the United States, in, in the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, there, there's addendums in there, which are the rules of admiralty. Now, in our Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, there is something, and by the way, everything is civil procedure, even though they call it criminal, it's still a civil procedure. But in any event, if you go to, I think it's Rule 9, uh, I forgot what subparagraph sub it is, but anyway, it talks about specific negative averment. Now, because of the nature of the federal courts being an admiralty, you are you are assumed guilty unless you can demonstrate otherwise. And so summary judgment is had immediately upon a filing of the uh, complaint. So the remedy for that summary judgment is specific negative environment, which basically deals with the fiction. And so anything that is created by an attorney and put into a court is deemed to be an a fiction, an assumption, unless it goes unrebutted. So you have to go and rebut the assumption to prevent it from turning into a presumption because the courts can't give a judgment or ruling on a presumptive evidence. So... The remedy for that is what's known as specific negative environment, whereas you deny that the thing that they're saying or doing exists. Now the burden of proof shifts from you back onto them because now they have to prove that it exists because the attorneys cannot introduce any fiction into the court unless you agree to it. And if you agree to it, they can put fictions in there all day long. So if they bring a fiction into the court, then you deny that it exists, and now the responsibility is upon them to prove that it exists. And if they can't prove that it exists, there's no subject matter. So when, when, when a judge or an attorney gets up and quotes some precedents, what would you do? I deny that Meads versus Meads exist. Now what do they have to do? <laughs> prove that it does yeah if they can't if they can't prove that it does then the assumption is burst asunder but if you go in there and let them get away with that again the assumption turns into a presumption and there you are you're off to the races and and a lot of people saying you don't even need paperwork as long as you can go into the court you could you could do this verbally yeah it's good to do it verbally but uh 
it, it should be a two-fold process. It should be done on paper, and it should be uh, done uh, orally as well. Now, let me tell you one of, one of the devices, you know, that I've developed over the years, <clears throat> and that is the use of affidavit pleading. I never put anything into the court unless it's in affidavit form. Now, why, do you, why would somebody think that I would do something like that? I'm using their same technique. Now, when I put uh, a affidavit of specific negative environment into the court, number one, that overcomes their assumption of uh, summary judgment because I'm rebutting line for line, point for point, all of their assumptions, and I'm denying them by specific negative environment. And because I'm doing it in affidavit form, now listen to this, because I'm doing it in affidavit form, that requires them to rebut my affidavit in affidavit form also. Now, an attorney cannot create an affidavit. An attorney does not have any firsthand knowledge of anything. And so an attorney cannot rebut an affidavit. And so when my affidavit has run for the requisite time, perhaps 21 days or 30 days, perhaps in some courts and whatnot, and when that affidavit has not been successfully rebutted, then I put in notice of default and request for summary judgment. I'm using their stuff. It's exactly the way they're using it with a, with a, with a little bit of uh, <laughs> extra energy put into it. You see what I mean? So that's the reason, you know, uh, you know, I, I've showed, I mean, I've shown this, uh, this technique since 2004 when I first did, started doing, you know, seminars as solutions and commerce. And it's worked very successfully for a lot of people if they press it. I mean, a lot of people just, you know, take a template or something like that and put it together and put it in there and then expect the paperwork to do, you know, to do the work for them. But that's not always the case. Sometimes it is. <clears throat> yeah, not I mean, always. I've seen a lot of guys, We go, you know, I help them with their paperwork. We go over it. It's pretty pristine. There's some good contractual liabilities in there. We've had the judges taken off cases. We had the crown taken off a case because, uh, because you know, the paperwork... And he had to bring people in from other jurisdictions in order to deal with it. But um, sometimes the paperwork is, is there, and sometimes these people go in there and they don't know how to hold their uh, hold, hold themselves verbally. They let these people walk all over them in the court. Well, it, it's essential, you know, for people. I mean, you know, a lot of times, you know, people's back is against the wall. And, and they and they do things without a good foundation and knowledge themselves. That's why it is essential. And that's why we put together this education program for people. It's essential to, to know how it works and what the proper things are to do before you get faced with a circumstance. I mean, I have so many phone calls from people, you know, who are in an emergency situation. And it would be so much better if if all the people would take the education and study it and be prepared, uh, you know, before they get faced with the circumstance. I mean, that just makes good common sense. Oh, and um, the other thing is, what what happened in the one court case is the the judge entered a plea, and then, uh, you know, I I was telling these guys because I in my workshops I'm like if they if ask them a question if they're answering a fee, and if they don't answer your question, answer it for them on it for the record. Um, the judge enters a plea and he goes, I thought only a defendant can enter a plea. He goes, no, no, the court can enter a plea, a, a, a plea for the defendant. Correct. And then he, uh, he goes, well, he goes on and for the record, the judge is taking full suretyship and liability for the, for the defendant by entering there a plea you on, go. <laughs> on behalf of the defendant. He goes, he goes, and the judge goes, we don't have no contractual relationship. <laughs> he oh, goes, yeah, well, you do. He goes, well, it appears that you, he goes, it appears that you're entering a plea on behalf of the defendant. And then they went back and forth, back and forth. And he goes, and the judge goes, well, I'm not taking liability for that. And he goes, he goes, well, you entered a plea. And it's really funny. I have the audio up on YouTube. <laughs> and uh, and then he goes, well, you don't, you don't. He goes, you're arguing liability. He goes, you argue surety ship. That's it. And then and he kind of was. It's such a funny, it's such a funny back and forth between these two because he starts going into calling it mumbo jumbo. He goes, your mumbo jumbo was going to work in in the court today or something like that. And I know mumbo jumbo is magic. 
Well, that's why, you know, if it says, we've said something like, you know, mm-hmm. use a term like mumbo jumbo, do you say, will, will, will you please define what mumbo jumbo is? Because I have, I have a law dictionary and I can't find that. <laughs> well, yeah, well, they, they just keep, they, you know, when you ask questions, they don't answer. They just keep on trucking on. All right, now here's important. Here's something that's really important for people to do. Number one, you're the court. You know, not the guy sitting up front, not the clerk. You're the court. Now, and so everybody there is working for you. And so if you ask one of your employees a question and they don't answer it, what should you do? Oh, we, we, give, it, we give them the answer. Answer it for them. For them yeah. on the record. Judge so-and-so refused to answer this question. Therefore, the answer is for the record, you know, whatever. I did that. They, uh, the judge goes, I didn't agree to that. Oh, yes, you did, but you're silent, you fool. Uh, you, you idiot. <laughs> Shouldn't <laughs> yeah, say fool. That's a bad word to use. But uh, fool, no, fool. They, they, they did agree to it when they didn't answer. She it's, agreed She agreed a second time when she denied it because those who deny admit. Yeah. Isn't that maximum law? Well, yeah. If she denied it, then she, she uh, uh, authenticated that it does exist. Now, she only denied it from her position. Did she, did she change the record? Uh, n- no, no. When you went, when you went on the record, I mean, she can say denied or object or whatever you want to say, but now it's a part of the record. The only way they can remove that from, a, from the record is to hold a trial. Yeah. They want to hold a trial. That's what they've been trying to do with me. They want to hold a trial to remove that from the record. I mean, what I'm saying is in order to get something off the record, they have to hold a trial. And that trial has to be a jury trial because now it's a part of the record. That's why it's so important to go on the record when you say things. Oh, and that's why you would you would you'd want to request a jury trial, wouldn't you? No, they would have if they want to remove it from the record. They if they remove if a judge removes anything from the record, unless a jury should take that responsibility upon themselves then that judge is guilty of evidence tampering, which is a federal crime. And um, do you know of any way to get any of the transcripts without paying like out the uh, yin-yang for that? Transcripts of a trial? Yeah. Or well, make your own record. You mean like bring in your own uh, recorder or, or you, audio? Yeah, in a lot of the cases, if it's serious enough, people will bring their own recorder. Or, I mean, you know, court reporter... You get an official transcript, or you can simply, after the hearing or whatever is over with, you can memorialize the conversation in affidavit form. Okay. Yeah, a lot of guys are recording it now in the in the court. Yeah, that's, good. That's where I got the audio from. Great. The audio isn't great, but you could you can still hear what's going on, and you can hear a lot of the judges uh, bantering back and forth and. What's going on is now they're not even really trying to hear you anymore. They're just grabbing you and throwing you in jail if you start. Um, um, That's when you know you're winning. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, the one guy got thrown in jail for the day because he wouldn't stand up for the judge. <laughs> Did they bring the Bible in in front of him? No, no. The the, the um, bailiff nope. was just like, you need to stand. The and only he re- went. <clears throat> the only, historically, the only reason we stand is because the bailiff would bring in the King James version of the Bible in front of the judge. So nobody was standing for the judge; they were standing for the King James version. Oh, okay. So that's where standing comes from. Correct. Huh. That's why I ask you. You know, if <clears throat> you know, if if, if some if the bailiff you know told that guy you need to stand up, first question he should ask the bailiff is, "Well, where's the King James Bible at?" I always yeah. stand for King James. You understand that King James version of the Bible, when it was created by King James, <laughs> of all people, uh, <laughs> it, it was authorized for use in the churches and the courts. Now, now the reason why everybody in in the in the courtroom stood up was not because the judge came in, it was because the King James version came in, and they stood up on the basis that the King James Version gave them standing in that court. And you know I mean, what? That's the first it, time it, I heard that. That's, it's I never heard that. Well, it's, it's historical. Now, uh, it used to be that when witnesses were called to swear in, you know, do you promise to tell the whole truth and all that kind of stuff, that they put their hand on the King James Version. 
because again, the, uh, you know, it's not the it, it's not the Geneva Bible. You know, it's not the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's the King James Version that was authorized by King James for use as an authority in the courts and in the churches. So based on that authority, then people were willing to swear that they would tell the truth. And then they were held to it on that basis. And so the key to the court system, again, is the King James Version of the Holy Bible. And if the bailiff don't come into court carrying the King James Version, then there's no standing in that court for anyone. But then again, we're getting back into some of the common law concepts, and now we're operating in admiralty. And that sort of thing doesn't happen, and I've never seen that happen in Admiralty, them carrying a Bible. Well, if you want to, bring your own King James, but if the bailiff you know, told the guy, said, hey, stand up for the judge, all he had to do is say, my leg hurts, I can't stand up. Yeah. <laughs> he shouldn't get into an argument with it, he should do a demure. Just say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't stand up, my leg hurts. Yeah, well, this guy said, um, he, I don't know, he, he said something to them, and then the, the judge uh, ordered the bailiff to take him away. Well, there you go. I mean, he got into an argument. He yeah. should got he should have got into a demur to say, "I'm sorry, I can't stand up. My leg hurts." Yeah. Um. Let's get back into the you 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 brought up comptroller to collect and that 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 you said that we're using, and I was sort of wanting to go back on that when you say we what 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 would be what would we be using in order to collect on that on that side to go to the comptroller? Uh, you know, I don't know what it's called. Uh, where you're at here here in the United States, each county has a, what's called a county comptroller, and they're the ones that all money passes through in regards to collecting funds at the federal window through the U.S. Treasury. And so I don't know what it's called in Canada where you're at, uh, but but any kind of instrument that's taken to the federal window for collection, you understand that I any debt of a U.S. citizen is collect is collectible through the U.S. Treasury. And in our case, it's the county comptroller of currency that does that. And so what, what's the applicable thing, you know, where you're at in Canada? I don't know the answer to that. You just have to investigate. So when you're, when you're saying um, <clears throat> any debt, you're saying you could, take, you could take someone's bill and go collect, get, get a check for it? Technically, if you want to go back, for instance, and look at acceptance for value, it, and the use of that coupon like you were talking about, turning it into a bill of exchange, you understand under negotiable instrument law, there's only two kinds of instruments. It's either notes or drafts. Uh, a, a, a note certainly is a two-party instrument, but a draft is a three-party instrument, which changes the nature of it. Uh, a, a note, for instance, is a deferral item, whereas a bill of exchange or a draft is a set-off item. And so when we do acceptance for value and we go ahead and create a bill of exchange, which people are calling a money order or you don't call it, makes a difference what you call it, it's a draft. Anyway, technically, let's say, for instance, a court case. On a court case, if you do an acceptance and return for settlement, then the court should technically take that acceptance to the county comptroller for the settlement of the account. But they're not doing it. So sometimes you have to force their hand on it. If need be, you know, you, you could actually take uh, an acceptance for value on a court case, and some have, directly to the county comptroller, to, so they'll take it to the federal window and get, and get the uh, uh, funds transferred, again, on the basis of the Chapter 11 bankruptcy we're running. It's all in the adjustment of the accounts. Adjustment. You know, write that word down a thousand times. <laughs> adjustment, yeah. adjustment, adjustment. That's what yeah. we're doing with that's accounts. All, we're that's, adjust all, that's all. That's part of my documents. I always say adjust the account to, to to adjust the account or ledger the account. Is it ledger or adjust it? What? Either way, adjust is fine. Anyway, yeah. you know the, what you're trying to get over to them is you know to use what I've given you to adjust this account and just tell them, hey, I'm doing this out of my goodness of my heart. I don't have to do it anyway. Yeah. Because you, you folks are in violation of public policy by what you're just doing. So I'm bending over backwards here to help you out of the problem that you're causing. So here it is. Here's all the information you need to adjust this account and go get it adjusted. If you don't, then you go, you fall under breach of fiduciary. Oh, that brings up another little thing when we're talking about courts here. 
is a lot of these guys are appointing lawyers as a fiduciary to go ahead and take care of a lot of these cases, and they're not. They're not. They're totally ignoring the appointment. Well, then they need to be sued for breach of fiduciary. <clears throat> so they can need a civil case brought against them. Yeah. Because, uh, because I guess a lawyer, that's part of their, that's part of their job. If someone appoints, even a judge, can you appoint a judge as well? Yeah, we've done that. We've done it, we've done it in Canada. I mean, oh, really? I, I told, did I tell this story before? No, you know, no. A lady, lady in BC called me up. She's right in the middle of a criminal case. And her, her ex-husband was, in fact, an attorney. He, he was, oh, Jimmy, he was stealing everything she had. And, and charging her criminally. So she got into a criminal thing in a court up there, and she called me up. She was kind of deep into it, and she was asking me, could, was there anything that could be done? I said, well, yeah. And so I gave her the information about her being the settler of the you know, straw woman account. And I said, the next time you go to court, I said, do two things. Have them ready. I said, number one, take a copy of the complaint. Do all the acceptance language on there. I said, number two, create an invoice. She said, what's the invoice for? I said, for all the time you spent in jail and for all the property they stole from you. So she created a certified invoice, and it came to something like $3 million. And they had taken a lot of property and put her in jail. So anyway, I so said, when you go to court this next time, I said, you announce to the judge that you're the settler on the you know, Jane Doe, you know, whatever her name was. I won't give her a name. Anyway, yeah, I said, Jane, just uh, Jane tell good. the judge. Yeah, I said, just tell the judge that you're the settler on the Jane Doe trust and that you're also the beneficiary. I said, at that point, I said, hand over the acceptance for value, which is for return and settlement. And I said, also at the same time, hand over that invoice and, and then demand payment on the invoice. And she did. She went right back in and did it. And that's, you know, that's the last time they ever had a hearing. You know, the case all of a sudden went dead. So she called me up and said, well, it's all gone dead now. She said, but what about that invoice? I said, well, go ahead, just like ever. And I said, send them a 30, a 60, and a 90-day notice. And I said, then once you've done that, and I said, that invoice turns into a security. And she knew what to do with the security. And so last I heard, she was still trying to chase down her money. I don't know if she ever got it or not out of them, but I'm just telling you, it sure brought a sure brought an end to that uh, criminal case. So she she didn't appoint nobody in that one. She just was invoicing them. Yeah, she appointed. She, yeah, she appointed the judge as the as the trustee fiduciary. Like verbally, or did she do that in writing? So as the settler, yeah, verbally, verbally, right there on the spot. So she came in, she announced, I'm the settler on the Jane Doe Trust, and I'm also the beneficiary, and I'm appointing you, Judge, as the fiduciary trustee on the trust. She passed over the acceptance for value. She passed over the invoice and asked them how quick they could get that invoice paid, and that's the last she heard of that court case. So, so she did that, so she handed over the originals in court. Yeah, original signature documents, always. And, she, and, she, and did she have that uh, document that you had? Uh, attached to it, or, she, or, she, or did she just hand over the original document, or does she have some sort of court document in order for what them to had, recognize okay. it? Let me go again. Just a bit, she just because because I'm sure a lot of people are listening okay, are going to be okay. Okay, let me let me go over it again. Yeah, she took a copy of the complaint, and she wrote the acceptance for value language on there, complete with deposit to. I don't know, I mean, we may have deposited to the Crown Treasury or whoever it is where you're at. Anyway, so she, you know, in charge back, you know, against Jane Doe, and then she gave her SIN number on top of that. All right. So, so along with that original signature acceptance, she created a certified invoice where she went and ledgered she was in jail, all the property they had stole from her. She got a, no a notary to uh, notarize her signature on that invoice, turning it into a certified invoice. And then she took, when she went to court, she took those two documents, 
She came in as a settler and beneficiary, nominated the judge as the trustee, passed over the original signature acceptance, the certified invoice, and then just said, how soon can you get that invoice paid? Now, they didn't pay it. The trustee did not pay it. Now, what does that mean? The judge is in breach of fiduciary. And could that judge have been sued on that invoice? The answer is absolutely yes. So she could have brought up a civil case against that judge then? She could have. For breach of fiduciary. You understand that the judges and all of the public officials, by definition, are fiduciaries to the public. And they have a fiduciary responsibility and they can't get away from it. They're getting a paycheck. They're being paid to do the job they're being paid from where? From the public. They're getting a paycheck. They have a fiduciary responsibility. So when you go and nominate and appoint them a fiduciary and they don't fulfill the demands placed on them by the beneficiary, then they're in breach of fiduciary. And yes, indeed, they can be sued and they could actually be prosecuted criminally because they're doing it with knowledge. It's not a mistake that they're not performing so you can sue them civilly for the damages or you could legally bring a criminal charge for breach of fiduciary with uh with knowledge yeah i think we'd probably have to find out how that interprets out here in canada well here in the united states we'd go probably go to title 42 the united states code for that uh you know there's other, there's other methodologies and stuff we've used to bolster that up and make it a little bit stronger and so forth uh, don't want to go into a whole lot of you know technical stuff, but in any event, that those are the principles that we operate with. All we've done is just go back and say, well, if, if it's good enough for the goose, it's good enough for the gander. So this is how you're doing it. So this is the way we'll do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they um, don't like they don't like it very very much when, you get, when it gets thrown back in their face. Right. Well, that's just too bad. Cry me a river of tears, but you're the guys that set this crap up. If you don't like your own crap, then stop trying to force it down our throat. Yeah, they're, they're more or less saying, hey, we're doing it, but you can't do it, you know, kind, yeah. kind of thing, right? Yeah. So over the years, we've simply studied to see how they're doing things and say, well, okay, if that's how they're doing it, that's the way we'll do it too. And so, so we throw it right back at them the same way they throw it at us. And then they cry and whine and say, you can't do this, you can't do that. Why not? You're doing it. Yeah, if it's good enough for you to do, why is why is it wrong for us to do it? I mean, you're the guys that set the system up. Don't cry when we use the system. Yeah, there's a, another guy. He, he I think he put like about two or three hundred wor- pages worth of case law in order to establish. Oh, geez, that's to, a waste of time. In in order to establish, you know, that this is why he has the right to travel, and this is why he has the right to do this and that. That's and, a waste of time. Uh, all you have to do is put together that proof of life demonstrating that you're a living sentient being. And get that into the record, and uh, then you're off to the races. At that point, then the fictions can't deal with you. And again, you know, if you go to the extent of putting that fiction and all those accounts and everything on a UCC financing statement, now you're in the first claim position anyway. Do you have a uh, example of that somewhere? Or? Of of what? That like what 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 that might look like to put it on, or do you just get a UCC one financing statement? Put those, put those, uh, you know, driver's license and SIN number and different numbers on that UCC, and then file it in there. Or? Well, you're, you're talking again. I think last time we talked about the difference between a national UCC one. Yeah, we and did talk state, about that. State form. Yeah. I, I of course prefer the state form because it's recorded and not filed. Right. If you if you use a national type form, then you're going to have to go to other measures to get into the same position that you would be in if you could get it recorded. And so, you know, maybe people can go back and review our conversation from last time. Yeah, yeah, no, I, that's totally I mean, that's totally um, what I wanted to get at. Maybe we get into the UCC real quickly here. Um, just to bring it up, I w- after we had our conversation, I went down to uh, a county recorder office, and we brought in some UCCs, and they didn't really want to file it because the property that we were filing the UC the, the the property that we were filing didn't have anything to do with that county. Well, she's like, "Well, we'll record well, it, but it ain't really gonna have any effect on that well, person's one, property." Okay, one of the things we do 
to get around some of that is we use a, a self-authenticating security agreement. And then it, within that security agreement itself, which is a binding contract, we, you know, which is authenticated by the fact that they don't come back and rebut it. So we get into a self-authenticating security agreement, and then we take the security agreement itself, which is property by definition, and then we, we record that property on the UCC financing statement. So, so at that point, then the property in question, whether it be, uh, you know, a driver's license or a, a deed to a property or a birth, whatever. Anyway, at that point, then we get into that same position. Uh, and then I, I don't see where your uh, county officials will have any problem recording a UCC1 financing statement that has a security agreement attached. So, so you would you would actually bring that security agreement in there with your UCC one and have it attached yes. to it as you record it. Yeah, it would be it it, it would be it would be uh, uh, on the on the financing statement as collateral. You oh, see, what, oh, the security is the collateral. The security agreement itself is collateral, and the security agreement would have the the property you're leaning in the in the agreement. Yeah, you can either you can either uh, attach it to the uh, financing statement, uh, which you know if it's several pages, it's going to cost you a little bit. Or you could simply refer to security. Put you know put it put a, a tracking number on your security agreement. You know one two three four five or whatever. Yeah, and then put and that then, on the UCC. Yeah, and then just refer on your on your on your financing statement to security agreement. You know number one two three four five in the possession of. So and so that can be you know in possession of the secured party, because the address of the secured party is going to be right there on the financing statement. Yeah, and then that that way you wouldn't need to put the actual property that you're going after because it'd be uh -huh. in the security agreement. Yeah, yeah. see, it goes it goes back to the concept that the paper is property, contracts are property, security agreements are property. So you list them as collateral. If anybody wants to come to look at it, you know they can. They can uh, certainly, you, you certainly would provide them that opportunity. But in the event that you had to go into court, now you bring your financing statement along with the security agreement, and say, "Look, you know this thing has been recorded, you know, for two years now. It's a part of the public record. You know, anybody that does business with my debtor, they had the opportunity to go and look at it, but they never did. So, you know, you know, you know, tough luck." And so now you now you bring your security agreement along with your recording of the UCC one financing statement into into court as a superior claim. You have to understand that in these admiralty courts, the the real question is is who has the claim on the described property that's a part of this civil suit or criminal suit? Who has the claim on that property? And so when you show up in court with a superior claim then that demonstrates that you're the prop you're the party that has has the right to the property whether it's your body or whether it's to a house a car to a contract to a, a driver's license or whatever you're the you're the one with the superior claim that's how admiralty works it's all about claims it's all it's, about claim. It's a claims court. Of course it is. It's a small claim court. You turn it into a small claim court. That's what you do. Because um, yeah, they and what what they had done <laughs> is one, and w the one guy the document we did for him it was funny because he he signed. He put the debtor and creditor on the bottom. He he altered the the document and he put creditor debtor, oh, that's and then okay. he and then he signed. But the uh, the problem was, he he was putting a lien on the Queen Elizabeth or Queen. Oh, that's not really smart. And so he he like signed Her Majesty the Queen or whatever, and then the lady goes looking at me like I was like I was like I don't know man they, I got I it was a trustee he told me to come down and do this and she's like well we can't file that we 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 know for sure I that's not. Either. That's not the queen's signature. <laughs> I would, yeah. See, in, in order to record or in order to file either a national form or a state-style state form of a UCC1, 
you have to have the permission of the debtor to do it. In other words, you have to have exhausted administrative due process. Now, I will say that acceptance for value does, in fact, complete administrative due process. And so you could legitimately file a UCC1 financing statement on anything that you had accepted. But in, in order to put the queen's name or put her signature upon a document, you have you would have to have her, her permission to do so. And first off, it's a foolish thing to do. There's no reason to do that. Because, again, John Doe is the same thing as the Queen of England is the same thing as the United States of America, uh, United States is the same thing as the United Nations is the same thing as the Federal Reserve Bank is the same thing as the Bank of England. They're all the same thing. So if you go file a, a recording or if you go record or file something against the debtor, John Doe, you, you have recorded against all of the fictions because they're all the same thing. So there's no reason to get the queen involved in that stuff. By implication, she's involved in it when John Doe's involved in it. So, I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, wh 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 why stir things up when you can do it this other way? Yeah, yeah. I thought it was just funny. I mean, but, um, yeah, she kind of looked at me, but she's like saying, well, if you want me to file, I'll file it, but I ain't going to have no real facts. She goes, if you, what you should be filing is up in Canada. You shouldn't file it down here. Well, like the, she got the manager out, and this other guy came out, and we're just sort of like, you know, kind of looking sideways. Yeah, the real question <laughs> is, is whether or not you have the permission of the debtor to put their to sign their name. <clears throat> now, if you could demonstrate that you did have the permission of the debtor to sign their name, uh, for instance, uh, here in the United States, or what what we've done in the past, again, in regards to the debtor. Is uh, our, our straw man debtor? We, you know, we get we get their permission by the use of that self-authenticating security agreement. And so, with based on that security agreement, you know, then we're authorized to sign the name of the debtor. It's it's all it's all in the fiction, folks. It's yeah. all in the, the, they they created the game. Uh, you know, if and, and uh, they can't complain if if we know if we learn the rules and if we play by the rules. Matter of fact, if we do play by the rules, we're the only party in existence that does. They yeah. certainly they certainly do not. Yeah, in a lot of in a lot of the documents I do have that you know failure to respond or upon a default, you're granting and conveying a, a specific power of attorney to, oh, file, yeah. to execute any and all documents and and and, and, <laughs> and pertaining to to the, this actual case, meaning of course I, I can go in court, get a summary default judgment. I don't even need to send it to the party. I could just say, yeah, I agree. I'm the, I got power of attorney over that, so the, both parties agree right now. I once got a communication. I forgot who it was from. Uh, it's either a bank or it was from a IRS or somebody. I can't remember who it was now. And they didn't sign the documents. So I wrote back to them and said, "Hey, you know, you sent me a document here with no signature on it. I said unless you tell me otherwise, I'm going to sign the President of the United States' name on that." <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, if they if they send unsigned documents, just write back to them and say, "Well, you know, you didn't sign your document. It, unless you notify me otherwise, I'm going to put your I'm going to sign your name on it." And that's that's their agreement. If they don't come back and say, "No, don't do that," or if they want to supply you with an original signature on a document, that'd be fine. But, uh, it, it, you know, if they won't sign their documents, if they send stuff to you right back and say, hey, unless you tell me otherwise, I'm going to sign your name to this. And, and that, that, That's their agreement. And we would put the CFO's name then. Sure, you can do that. I used, I used to know a guy, his favorite trick is he would uh, uh, contact, for instance, a bank or something like that. And he would say, uh, uh, unless you tell me otherwise, uh, you know, this is your this is your tacit agreement that I can use your letterhead. And then, then when he would do things, for instance, if he's going to do a reconveyance on a property or something like that, he would simply use the bank's letterhead to do the reconveyance. And so how would he sign their name though? Like say it was by their same agreement. So it was John Doe. He would, he write, uh, you know, John Doe one signing as power of attorney well, for John I mean, Doe two. I like, mean, if, uh, if, he, if he's going to do a reconveyance on property or something like that, he get you know get the bank's permission number one to use their letterhead, which looked very good. Then he would also get the permission of the CEO or CFO or whoever you know to to put their signature on it. So now all of a sudden, 
down at the at the recorder's office, a reconveyance shows up, you know, from the bank with the bank's letterhead, the bank signature on it. What, what do you think they're going to do down there at the recorder's office? They're going to reconvey it. <laughs> of course they are. <laughs> it's the game they created. They well, can't cry about it. But I guess what I'm trying to ask is that you don't need to put sign as power of attorney. You can just put their signature and that's it. Because you asked them, you said, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign your name. And if you don't say nothing, then you're giving me a, an agreement that, that I'm going to put it's your signature. It's a contract. Signature. See, yeah. th- this is the way we used to always, for instance, in court or t- to a to a law official. Law uh, official, they would say, you know, say what's your name, or the judge might say what's your name. Well, what's the response? The response is, well, what's your name? Because that judge knows if he can get your name, now he has contract with you and he can use that name. So if we come right back, we don't give him a name. We just say, well, what's your name? The judges will never give you their name. They know better to do that. Because, no, because they know they know that if, if if they give you their name their name that you can use it however you want to. Yeah, is that is that good? Maybe go in there with a name tag. That's what I always go. If I go to court, I always put a name tag. I never say my name in a court. <clears throat> They'll say, "Well, please state your name for the record." I say it's right here on my name tag. Can you see it from where you're at? Or do I need to get closer? They say, "Well, we need you to state it for the record." Well, then then you ask them for their name. Well, could, oh, yeah, could you please state your name for the record first? Yeah. Um, if you won't state your name, why would you expect that I'd state my name? <laughs> yeah, see? I like these games. That's a kind of... I, 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 I once went into... It's a, it's a small court. It's kind of like a magistrate or a traffic court. And that thing got started. And, uh, you know, I had my name tag on, so I went through that routine. But then I told the, told the judge, I said, you know what? I said, I don't know who everybody here is. I said, uh, I said, said who, what's your name? He pointed to his name tag, so I wrote it down. So I said, well, who's that sitting next to you there? You know, that, that was the clerk. And he actually gave me her first name, didn't give me her full name. And, and then the bailiff, I pointed to him and said, what's his name? And I knew his name because I was holding a $3 million lien against him. I knew what his name was, but I wanted him to say it. The, ju- the judge gave me his full name. And then I turned to the, the attorney and I said, what's your name? And he gave me his name. Can you believe that? He gave me his name. I said, what's your bar number? And he wouldn't give me his bar number. All he said was, well, he said, if I decide to prosecute you, <laughs> he said, I'll give you my bar number. <laughs> well, you know, they dismissed that case. Yeah. They dismissed that case. Yeah. But I, I learned that name game a long time ago with my kids. One time we were going across country, going back to see grandma. And I had a bunch of kids, and, you know, in the back of the pickup truck, you know, under a camper shell. And they were back there just, Rocking and rolling, you know, raising raising the dickens back there, and I had my one of my uh, teenage sons with me to be a co-driver, you know. And I said, "Look, I'm gonna pull over here." I said, "Go back there and settle them kids down." And so I stopped, and he jumped back there. You know, within within 30 seconds, everything was quiet back there. I don't, and I wondered, you know, what did he do? You know, did he pop a few of them, or what did he do? And finally, I asked him. I said, "How'd you get them kids to settle down?" He said, "I just took a, pa- a pencil and a piece of paper, and I said." I, he said, I'm taking names. He said, they all shut up. <laughs> so I learned that a long time ago. That, that name game is really important. Uh, really important thing. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's, it's really an interesting uh, situation. Yeah. And it was really interesting for me, too, because when, they, when, they, when I went into court, um, I said I'm here as, you know, John Doe. Uh-huh. And... Um, the lady kept going, I don't understand what you mean. Are you, are you, are you John Doe or are you, are you not? I said, well, what don't you understand? Did I not say I'm here as John Doe? <laughs> and and because I know the word as defined in the dictionary is to be in the capacity of a presence of it. It doesn't actually mean that you are. Sure. And and I, I'm sure they knew that. That's why, why Why else would they keep haranguing you about what do you mean as? Are you are you well, or aren't you? If, if you want to get into contract with them, and you might want to get into contract with them, you might ask them, well, if I give you my name, what are you going to do with it, or what are the terms of the contract that I'm entering into? And you may or may not want to give your name based on the terms of the contract. Yeah, they won't reveal it. I'm pretty sure from what I hear in Canada, they're pretty they're pretty um, rogue up here in Canada. They're really uh, they're, they're they're really out of control. A lot of these judges and um, um, yeah. bailiffs, like well, these you, these bailiffs, grabbed a, a bunch of guys and started slamming them around in the on the hallway in the court. Well, there you go. I mean that. I mean, any time they resort to physical violence, it means they're losing. 
Now, now you might ask, you know, if they ask for your name, you might say, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you permission to use, use my name, you know, for and on the record for, uh, for 30, for 30 minutes. With no, with no, no price tag to that. Well, you could, you could put a price tag on what you're saying, but you know, establish the contract that they're going to go by. If you give them unlimited contract, they do anything they want to. So they say, you know, we're going to hold you in contempt if you don't give your name. You say, well, you, uh, I'll give you my name on the on the basis of the following contract that you can use my name. You cannot trade upon my name, but you can use it for you know the next thirty minutes. And then if I like the way you use it, I'll let you use it for a little bit longer. But it's only going to be <laughs> used. See what I mean? Yeah. Contract with them. If you, if, oh yeah. If you don't put the terms of the contract, if you just give them their name, it's like signing signing your name on a document unrestricted. No, you always put by, you know, uh, or authorized representative or beneficiary or some kind of restriction on your, your UCC 1-308 kind of thing. You always put some kind of restriction when anytime you sign the document. If you say your name out out loud without giving any kind of restrictions on it, they can do anything they want to with it. Yeah, so you say, oh, yeah, I'll give you the name on condition that you provide provide me $10,000 right now after, yeah. after doing so. yeah. Well, I accept your offer to contract, and I return it to you for value, for the value of $10,000. So go ahead and cut a check for 10000 and you can go ahead and use that name for you know, the next 30 minutes or whatever. See what I mean? You have to establish the terms of the contract. They're trying to contract with you. Oh, yeah. I, the, once, had, I once had a – I mean, I was once at a hearing, and we were doing – I was helping a fellow on a criminal matter, and it didn't go the way that – you know the court liked it to go and so i was accosted out in the hallway after the hearing by an attorney and the attorney jumped in my face and was yelling and screaming at me and making all kinds of accusations and i looked him right straight in the eye and i said i do not contract with you get out of my face he shut up immediately and walked away i just all said i do not contract with you get out of my face he just turned around and walked away so again, it's about you know about verbal contracts and all kinds of, you know all kinds of tricky things you know that they think they're only, that they're the only ones that know anything about. Yeah, they. I mean, there's a few. Is there, do you have any like any stories like that? Any, I mean that that's a interesting story. Do you have any other uh, anything that comes to mind of um, like when I told you about the guy? He says, "Well, um, you're going to be taking liability and suretyship for the defendant." And the judge goes, well, we don't have no contractual um, uh, oblig- contract with each other to do that. Well, then doing that, uh, first thing I would ask him was, well, judge, did you get a paycheck this last time? Are you being paid for sitting there? You, know, you say, of course. Well, then, then you have a fiduciary responsibility because I, I am one of the public. And you have a fiduciary responsibility to the public. And uh, this one judge... After he was bantering back and forth, he said something like he looked out to the crowd. He didn't look at the defendant. He goes, he goes. Everybody here is on a uh, social contract, whether you agree to it or not. Well, that's called an adhesion contract. It's unconscionable. And then if I was that, my the, the guy who I was helping, if I was him, I would have said, well, what makes you believe is this a dictatorship where I, I can't, I can't say what I agree to or not? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Well, you could. You could say something like that. But, hey, if the guy wants to contract, all you got to do is put forth the terms of the contracts. All you have to do is indenture the trust that you're getting involved in there and appoint him the fiduciary and then tell him, carry out the demands of the contract, carry out the demands of the indenture here, and I'll give you, you know, 10 days to get it done. And if you don't, then I'm going to sue your pants off for breach of fiduciary and bring a criminal charge because you do it with knowledge, and I'm going to prefer a criminal charge to the attorney general. Yeah, yeah. What what would happen if you know if all of a sudden you know ten thousand people did that? Yeah, that would ch- uh, do a change. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the the other thing is uh, here's another something that came up recently in Ke- in Quebec. They actually took down the criminal code, or the criminal code is be- becoming um, non. They can't use it nowhere because. They're saying that the queen has become a um, um, a litigant, or not angry litigant, but a um, what do you call that? Um, belligerent. Not belligerent. There's another word they have, and I can't think of it right now. I don't know why, but um, 
ve- vexatious litigant. Oh, good. And because uh, this one gentleman was, he I guess he was doing what you're saying. He was bringing criminal charges against people, and I guess he had about 10 or 12 of them going on at the same time. Mm-hmm. And they said, well, we, get, we can't allow you pursuing these no more because you're a vexatious litigant. And then, so I guess he brought up some other case and said, well, this, the queen's vexatious litigant, I'm only bringing 10 or 12 and she has about 20,000 going on at the same time. So, so, <laughs> and, and so, so that brought down the criminal code. They weren't able to use it no more. Or, or now it's for some, I think it, it just happened recently. So I think they're going to start using that at that the queen's a, a vexatious, a, vexa, a vexatious litigant Good. and the, and therefore you throwing out her any charges that she brings. Good. For those who may not know, it's a and plus there's no um, civil code in Canada other than in Quebec. Uh, Quebec's kind of a different place. Uh, I think they still have a lot of French law and stuff in, intertwined. Yeah, Napoleon law. Na- yeah, Napoleonic <laughs> law. Napoleonic law is uh, different. We had that same situation down here in the in the state of Louisiana, uh, and they were operating under uh, Napoleonic law to a large extent. But but uh, it, it took a long time for the Uniform Commercial Code to be uh, statutized in Louisiana, but it's been done now. But yeah, we've had that same problem down here. We had quite a few French uh, uh, background people down in uh, New Orleans and places like that. Yeah, and um, what 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 I was thinking is, civil uh, Quebec is Upper Canada. Uh huh. And um. I think that's there's a there's an upper and lower Canada from long time ago, and the this, the Quebec Civil Code, which would be the QCC, kind of almost sounds like a UCC to me. Good, I don't know. Because uh, from what I from what I've researched in Canada, there is no law governing the contra- laws of contract like a UCC or or you know in the in it, the it, ar- it, in the it articles. Depends. It depends on how the contract is to be executed. If it's to be executed in fiat currency, it's not a contract. If the okay. contract is to be executed in gold or silver, it can be a private contract. Or commodities. You know, wheat, lumber, all those kind of things. You know, those would be appropriate contracts because they can be executed because the contract is executed in substance. Oh, so but, like, a, like a house or a car or something. It could be, but you have to understand that when you're dealing in real estate and in vehicles and so forth, you're only dealing with the title to them. That's where the rub comes in. Oh, yeah, because you're not actually dealing with the physical. You're actually just dealing with the paper. That's all you're dealing with. And that's when, fiction. When, yeah, when you, go, when you go for a real estate deal, the only thing that happens is, is a transfer of title. They don't transfer the house. The house has to go into escrow. Uh, I mean, a lot. <laughs> well, we're going to get a long discussion here to explain all that to the people who are listening. That and that might be, a, you know, another hour. And we're kind yeah. of coming up on a little bit of time here, so we have to yeah. cut it off before it gets too long. But uh, yeah, yeah, we but, can go into that into another. And if we ever if we do another one, we could follow up with that. Sure. But um, maybe um, maybe it's maybe uh, a little bit of we went into what the UCC a little bit there. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Registering their uh, the birth. The birth certificate, because you'd put your per, your birth certificate on there as, as well, right? Uh, yeah, I would. And the sin number and driver's license and and anything, yeah. What people? Someone asked me, why do we want to lean our our straw man? Why do we want to put a, a three get, billion to get, dollar to get into the first lien position again? Who has the claim on the assets of of the that, that are registered to the straw man? Who has the claim on that? Do you want somebody else to have the claim, or would you prefer to have the claim? And and so if you, if someone will try to go for a credit card or a mortgage, that lien on the name won't show up. It would if you bring it in, bring it into court. Oh, okay. So put, put it on the record. So so a credit reporting agency wouldn't have access to that. They should. You know, you have to understand this one concept. People should. Uh, you know, memorize this and think about it. And that is, whoever does business with my debtor becomes my debtor. So if someone is doing business with John Doe in all capital letters, then if I have a legitimate uh, uh, claim on John Doe in all capital letters, 
whoever does business with John Doe and all the capitalists now becomes my debtor. And so before doing any kind of uh, a business deal or whatever, certainly people should go and do a UCC1 search to see who has the claim on that debtor. And if, if they don't do it, then they fall right, you know, they, they could in fact fall right into a trap. For instance, let's say, for instance, that I have a security agreement, a self-authenticating security agreement with, uh, with my straw man. I have it on a UCC1 financing statement, either filed or recorded. And then someone decides that they want to do business with the my straw man. And let's say they're able to extract, for instance, like through a court, if they take a complaint and take it through the comptroller and get funds for it, the question is, whose money is that? It's my money. You go look at the security agreement. I have the first claim, and my security agreement basically states that the, the straw man owes me, let's say, $10 billion. That's why I've said in the past, in order for anybody to actually profit by anything they get from my straw man, they're going to have to get 10, 10 billion and one dollars or they're not going to get anything because the first 10 billion are mine that's how the ucc works so we put these things in place you know are you capable of enforcing them that's the only question I, so, I, I, that's I all guess, we have education for people and i guess the, the recording the state form now now the national form and state form from what i could tell you can only you you, you can only seem to get the uh, national form online. You can't you get a state form online. You used to be at, no uh, state form. We, we generally had to go and get a physical document, but you can make your own. That, the, the first uh, UCC one I filed, I just made my own. I think you have a copy. Of it. If you don't have a copy of it, you send me an email. I'll send you a copy of it. Okay, yeah, I'll it's do all, that. It's all, it's all over the place. I can't imagine you don't have a copy. But is is that that green one? Yeah, I think I've seen that. Yeah, that's a, a state form. That's a state form that I created. So you would just ba based on their state form. So you would just you would just change the uh, state name in order to to follow like because yeah. I'm in Washington State down down here in Vancouver area. Sure. And so we would just put cha take your your form and then just make something similar, but just put the, uh, the Washington, Washington state. In the state of Kentucky. And then go down to the recorder and, and, and record your birth certificate with a $3 billion lien on it. Now, now, now does there have to be a security well, put, agreement? I, I, would put, I, would, I would put all that in a self-authenticating security agreement. Yeah, yeah. So what, what about, I mean, another issue with people is the police. Um, recently, there's been quite a few videos of them beating down a lot of the First Nation people. That is they like as they put it in the news. I know I, my people aren't First Nations. Where the Haudenosaunee, or the uh, whatever name that we're using for whatever nation, whether we're Mohawk in our language or Cayuga or or whatever. Yeah. These these guys, I think they, they need to be taught a lesson to, and and I think their bonds need to be taken or made made a claim on and and a lot of these well, guys. Let, let, let me tell you what I did years ago that might be of interest to you. And then we have to cut this off, okay? Okay. Years ago, when I was first learning all this stuff, I came upon information uh, basically from Hartford Van Dyke and other parties who were using commercial liens. And so I studied into that and, and uh, found out, you know, I mean, I found, I mean, I, I, I'd studied it and learned it and all that kind of thing. And so an opportunity came up for me to first try it out. So I did, and so on a particular occasion, I got pulled over by a law enforcement officer who happened to be uh, a marshal for uh, one of the small towns around there. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, he pulled me over, and without any particular reason, and so uh, yeah, I went through all that rigmarole, and then what I did was I went and put a commercial lien on this officer in his private capacity and you know what happened after that was they took him out of the patrol car put him on a desk and as far as i know he's still there and that was about 13 years ago and the reason why it was because that lien was not paid they could not bond him 
they could not get an insurance policy on him to allow him to be out in a patrol car. Now, all these, all these uh, people that are beaten up, uh, you know, citizens or, or Native, uh, first, uh, you know, whatever you call yourself, Native Americans, whatever, if they, you know, if they're profiling or whatever, you know, that was what I did way back when, and it seemed to work real good. Yeah, they, they, these guys won't give you, they, they have a number, and not, there's no, and then the, the uh, station won't give you their name, but their name is on. That's, that's, that's not a problem. John Doe doing business as number one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, they have a last name and, a, and a, an initial, and that's about all you'll get. So I'm, I'm wondering, how did you find out this guy's personal info in order to even get a lien on any of his personal property? In his case, I asked him his name, and he gave it to me. Oh. And so then you're able to research and find out everything about who he was, or I didn't. I, I didn't need to know everything about him. Uh, uh, in the United States, I don't know if it's the same where you're at, but but each officer is required to carry a business card. He gave me his business card with his name and information on it. And so, anytime we're stopped here in the United States, it may not be the same where you're at, but we always, you know, we always ask him. I, you know, I need a copy of your business card, and they're required by law to give it to you. They won't usually give it to you until the transaction is over with, but that's fine. And so we always ask them for their business card, and they will. They'll produce their business card. A lot of them tell me they don't have it, or they'll they'll when I ask them for ID, they go they start pointing at their their uniform and going that car in this uniform. They said um, we don't need identification. You, okay, you, you know, don't don't get into a confrontate. A confrontation with these people because they will, you know, draw guns or clubs or whatever and beat you with it. Why, why go a lot of trouble? You know, agree with your adversary while you're in the way with him. You agree with him. You know, sign their documents or all that crap. You know, have you want to sign the stuff and then and then go do your business. You know, when you're not in danger of getting beat up or shot. Yeah, yeah, that's what I. That's my uh, my way all the time. I tell these guys to do that because once he started, he what he what I when I questioned the guy when he pulled me over. Right away, he like he starts like he called backup, so like ten cop cars are behind me. Great. So, so then I just start, you know, now you I got ten out, witnesses. It's like oh, okay, here we go, and I start because I had a contract that I wrote up on my car it says anybody who makes a commercial presentment to me or puts a commercial presentment on the car pays me five thousand, and towing it's fifteen thousand, and don't do it if you don't agree. <laughs> Good. So, um, cause just like any parking sign, it says uh, don't park here if you don't agree to the terms and stipulations. So I said don't. Don't do any of this stuff unless you agree with the terms and stipulations herein, and it's all notarized and it's stuck to the car. And well, else, sounds like, sound like you're well on your way to getting things uh, taken care of there. Dude. Yeah, I I invoiced the guy who towed the car, so you know the, the guy, the owners of the tow truck company's face dropped when he saw me hand him these these documents with the with the agreement that he's agreeing to, you know, offer up all his movable assets and everything. <laughs> <laughs> in, in exchange for the fifteen thousand dollars that he agreed to pay me, and I said that each month you don't pay me, it's going to be a hundred thousand dollars, and I said it's about one point two million dollars for every year you don't pay me. Yeah, I said that's the penalty if you're not paying me. There you go. But um, but yeah, yeah. I mean now all, now all you have to do is enforce that contract. Yeah, that's the problem, and that and that's thing. That's all you gotta do they, is send that contract to to their bonding company. And they'll shut them down. See, that's what happened when I put that commercial lien against that officer. It got back to the bonding company, and they would no longer issue a bond on that officer. And if they couldn't bond him, they couldn't put him in a police car where he would go out and create any further liabilities because then it would be on them. He was he was an uninsured motorist if he went out. <laughs> and the thing is, hot. A lot of these guys don't they have to give you their policy number and the underwriters of their bond their policy? Well, uh, if if you go and record in the county recorder, there's a vehicle within the recorder's office that the bonding company will be notified. Oh yeah, and yeah. So even in yep. Canada, UCC would would they'd be notified in Canada as well? Could be. I'm not sure how everything works in Canada. I'm just telling you how it, how it happened with me, and then you know you can make something work. Yeah, they have a. Uh, the PPSA, which is for movable property, and the, this thing called the Terranet, T-A-R-A-N-E-T dot C-A. It's a, something for property. Mm -hmm. But from I, I just it's frustrating up here because they don't really have any UCC sort of implementations except for the PPSA. 
Well, uh, there's ways to get around all that. I mean, if you have to, you can always record in the Washington, D.C. Uh, it for international uh, UCC1 filings. Oh, there's an international UCC1 filing? Yeah, Washington, D.C. Oh, see, now that's a different conversation. Yeah, some of the guys from Canada I know of had actually gone to uh, D.C. Or, or sent their uh, filings into D.C. Uh, you know, at the international office. So, anyway, th- those things are available. Okay, well, like I said, another time, another conversation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm um, about four out here already, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, it's really great having you uh, come on and, and help us, help us uh, you know, bang around through the dark here. Yeah. Because... Uh, <laughs> A lot of us are in the. A lot of the people are in the dark with a lot of this stuff. Uh, the last interview really enlightened a lot of people with what, with uh, what's going on. Yeah, and again, like I said, let me just just advertise a little bit here, and that is if you go to my website, which is wssic.com, which stands for Winston Shroud Solution in Commerce. Uh, if you want to go onto that website, we've also developed a YouTube. Eventually, this interview will end up there. But also, if you go down to the products list. Uh, all the things that I've talked about here are things that we have available uh, on DVD form, along with templates and different things, you know, that, that we've used. We Since 2004, when I first came up under this Solutions in Commerce title, I mean, I, I was just commiserating with one of my buddies that's been with me, you know, from the start, really. And we were just, you know, kind of chuckling about the mountain of information that we've been able to put out. I mean... <laughs> We've been in, we've been at it now for uh, eight and a half, going on nine years, or or whatever it is, and, and the amount of information that we've accumulated, the technology that we've developed is monumental. And so, if if people want to to delve deeply into, for instance, commercial liens, you know, there, there's a single topic DVD devoted solely to commercial liens along with the templates of various styles and applications and so forth. So, you know, my recommendation, you know, is to get educated. And, you know, and uh, I mean, you know, the talk and conversation we have on the air here and so forth is an indication of what can be done. Uh, and then people have to roll up their sleeves, get the information, study it, and, and, and then apply it. So, uh, you know, I'd recommend people. To become educated, you know, not just through me, but there's a lot of people that's put out, you know, good, good information that's very helpful. And so my recommendation is, uh, you know, turn off that TV for a couple hours every evening and study. I was kind of joking with one lady here at the last seminar we did. <clears throat> she she blamed me that she couldn't get any sleep. I said, <laughs> I said, why is that? She said, my husband and all his cronies sat up all night listening to your DVDs. And she said, I try to go to bed, but they keep it up too loud laughing to carry it on. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, you know, a certain amount of time uh, should be devoted, you know, for, for those who are concerned with these issues and so forth to study. And, uh, you know, if, if you was to apply an hour, two hours, or maybe five hours a week or something like that to study, you'd be well, well rewarded put it that way yeah and do you have any recommendations on some people they could go study as well or well, it's all over the internet I, I i recommend to people to get as broad a spectrum as possible don't disbelieve what winston has to say find out what everybody else has to say and uh and then and then you know and and, and take the things that are most applicable to your situation but like i say we've been doing this for since 2004 gosh i can't <laughs> I mean, the mountain of information, you know, that we've accumulated and passed on and so forth is uh, tremendous. So, anyway. Okay. Anything else you want to advertise? Any upcoming seminars or any uh, uh, anything well, coming in the uh, future? I'm DVDs? For, uh, well, I'm, I'm headed for Australia uh, at the end of this month. I'll be back uh, in August, and then we're going to have a webinar uh, that's going to be devoted to an understanding of the exemption and how to use it. And that will be presented, I think, uh, probably the last weekend in August. You'll have to go on the website to see the exact date. But, uh, you know, I, I, I strongly recommend uh, these webinars. You know, they're on a single topic. They're directed. It's not like having a two-day seminar. It's a, But it's a, it's a one subject. 
along with you know remedies and so forth. So yeah, go on the website and look at that. Uh, the webinar coming up, and I think we're anticipating toward the end of the year, perhaps November, to do a a, a full blown seminar. So uh, those things are all advertised on the website and with dates and conditions and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, go go to the website and take a look at that. Look at the product list it, it, for each seminar that we did. The subject matter that was discussed at that particular seminar is listed on that product list. Uh, you know. So you you know if you have a particular interest in a particular thing you know you can go and look at that particular thing or yeah uh, and then so, a, and a DVD will be made of that Australia for those who can't make it to the Australia no, seminar no that's that's going to be a private workshop okay uh, that's not an open seminar <clears throat> but uh, the webinar certainly is uh, you know for public consumption and uh, the in any seminar certainly we do here in the states is is wide open too. So, so. So are you not allowed in Canada no more? You can't come up here and do any uh, more seminars? Last time, I try, last time I tried to get in Canada, they told me to stop me at the border and said, don't come back anymore. If you try it, we'll arrest you. So, uh, so like, I, don't, I don't come to Canada, but they can't stop the Internet now, can they? Sounds like a, sounds like a contract to me. <laughs> uh, I thought about it for a while, but I had more important things to do than argue with them. They get, didn't get arrested? <laughs> well, uh that's not that so much. I, I knew that, you know, if I went and took uh, action on that, uh, for instance, if I, you know, if I threw a you know, hundred million dollar lien on them, it, it would screw things up too much for them. I mean, you know, up there in the, where it occurred in the Vancouver or, or in BC, uh, you know, if I had to take action against BC, you know, I knew they were on the ropes, you know, as far as finances and everything, they're having a tough time of it. I mean, I, I think the whole economy in BC is uh, actually funded by the marijuana that's grown on the island out there and transported into the United States. So, <laughs> hey, I ain't kidding you. You know, when they were when they were holding me there, I was talking to that one uh, enforcement officer there. You know about the uh, about the marijuana problem, it, it, and and the, and one of those officers said, "Well, if you want some marijuana, he says just go down the street. This guy knew where to get dope at." <laughs> he was standing right there keeping me out of Canada telling me where to go there in Victoria to get dope <laughs> so, so I knew their economy must be hurting pretty bad and I knew if I took you know, a, a real decisive action against them for what they had done to me they, they didn't know, it, it would only hurt the people and so I said no nah, I'll just you know, let that go like I said we have the internet and everything I mean I don't have to physically be somewhere no, you could you could do like we, we I could have run a, se a seminar with you just on Skype right now with people there. For sure. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, well, I mean, uh, we appreciate your time uh, as always, Winston. Uh, we look forward to doing an, a follow up um, with some of the other issues that we we come up with, yeah. and other, some other things like uh, doing a writ. There's uh, people who are interested in doing writs and. Um, cool. Okay. Maybe getting a little bit more in the press of pay. Um, yeah, we, we we would probably address some of those issues under the basis of habeas corpus. Yeah, so we oh. we could do that. Matter of okay. fact, I do I do have a single topic DVD on habeas corpus if people are interested in that. Well, there you go. There, I mean, there you go. Yeah, yeah, it's going on the website. It'll be listed there under the uh, products and stuff. Okay. Well, it, we thank you again for coming on, and uh, it's been great having you. Okie dokie. Well, we'll catch up again some other time. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So. Um,